All right. Hey, what's going on, Fight Fan? This is Coach D, the Wild Man, coming at you again with another episode of MMA Fight Camp. All right. You know I do an MMA Fight Camp. I talk about all things MMA, from the pro scene to the local scene. All right. Today's topic, let's go ahead and get right in it. Today's topic is, why should a fighter have a manager? Uh, in, this, in this landscape of MMA, um, some fighters seeing their rise to the top they go to big promotions they do big shows and they make decent money and then you have other fighters who can't seem to get great paydays can't seem to good good fights seem to run into all kind of problems with their contracts seems a lot of things seem to go wrong when it comes to them either negotiating themselves or not having somebody represent them not reading the fine print so many things can go wrong when it comes to the mma game and being a fighter so today I decided to bring in a manager, which is Dave Avello. He's going to talk about who he is, um, what he does, and we're going to get into the conversation of having a manager. So Dave, what's going on, man? What's up, dude? How are you? Man, I'm doing great. We are at it again, as you can see. Yep. All right, so kind of tell the fight fans uh, who you are, where you work, and what you do. Uh, my name is David Arvello. I'm an agent for Sucker Punch Entertainment, uh, one of the biggest, uh, you know, fighter management and talent agencies in combat sports. And we also are involved in other sports outside of, um, you know, fighting as well. And, you know, we've uh, done a lot over time, you know, as far as managing, you know, multiple champions in the UFC, you know, Bellator. Um, pretty soon, I think, with our guy Josh the Cuddly Bear Copeland, we're going to have a PFL champ. Okay. Uh, I, I think he's uh, I think he's got an extremely good shot to win this uh, uh, first heavyweight tournament that they're doing. And, you know, he'll be walking away with a cool million dollars from that on New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, there's that as well. You know, and we've over the years, we've also secured a lot of, uh, you know, high level endorsements uh, for a lot of fighters, both in and outside of fighting movie roles, all that other good stuff. Um, so, you know, what we do is a little bit different in that, you know, our sole source of revenue isn't just, uh, you know, commissions from fighter purses. Uh, mm -hmm. That's actually kind of um, just a piece of what we do. Um, the other large part of what we do is also just stuff on the sponsorship and endorsement side, as well as just kind of, um, you know, other marketing and advertising opportunities um, outside of, you know, what happens in the ring. So, okay. So, um, so let's, let's, let's bring up today's topic. Uh, sure. Like I said, you know, you're, I know, I know you're all over the place, but like I said, I'm from Columbus, South Carolina, so yep. you know, I'm always tuning in on what happens with, you know, the Southeast fighters, you know, you manage a couple, you know what I'm saying? So, but what I'm seeing on social media. I mean, media, give, give me a little bit more credit than that. I, I manage more than just a couple, man. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah of, course, of, course, of course you do, but like I said, sure. the guys yeah. I talk to on a regular basis. Yeah, you know yeah no worries, man. I got you. You know, so, so, so and what I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot of disparity, uh, disparity in different, you know, approaches to mm -hmm. having a manager. I see a lot of yeah. fighters who don't have managers seem to be having difficulty, you know, getting great fights or getting great deals or going through so so many problems. And and we'll we'll talk about that as we go on with the conversation. And then we have other fighters seem to be just fine. Uh, with nothing going wrong, you know, the check's clear and they seem to be on, on to the next thing. So in a, in a nutshell, why should a fighter have a manager? Well, uh, I would say there's kind of a, a multi-layered answer to that. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, management can take different forms, right? You know, some fighters will have an outside manager. Some fighters are at a gym to where, you know, their main trainer or coach kind of functions as their manager. And if that mm -hmm. coach has a good track record and, you know, is able to kind of do, you know, some of those things kind of at a local level or, you know, whatever, then great. You know what I mean? It's there, there are some coaches out there who are like solid managers and do a very good job at that. Um, you know, but uh, sometimes, you know, you have coaches who are great coaches, but, you know, getting like, you know, good fight opportunities or the business side, whether it's just, kind of maybe an understanding thing or, or really more oftentimes it's like uh, I, I feel like coaches kind of get a bum rap in that respect sometimes is that yeah. you know most of these coaches at gyms 
have a full time job and then they coach. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, you know, a lot of these guys have families and other stuff outside of that. And I mean, I know, you know, at least on my end of things, I mean, you know, fights and fight bookings and dealing with different promotions and matchmakers, that's an all day, well into the night, wee hours of the morning kind of thing. So it's mm-hmm. like, you know, there are some coaches who that I know who just don't want to deal with that kind of stuff, because at yeah. some point, you know, they have to have a little bit of off time because they have a wife and kids or just, you know, want to have a little bit of personal time before they go to sleep. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, fight bookings is just one part of it. Uh, sponsorship is kind of, you know, n- another aspect of it, but you know, that landscape has kind of changed over time. Um, it used to be, you know, kind of back in the day, you had a lot of companies who, you know, MMA was very new. So they're just throwing money at stuff. Yeah. Um, Whereas now you have to approach that like you would, you know, kind of a more traditional marketing or advertising deal. Companies aren't just, you know, throwing money up in the air and making it rain anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you you, like they actually want to get some form of like advertising and ROI for their dollars. Yeah. So, you know, work. Yep. Adjust your phone. There you go. Sorry, man. I had to silence a call. No problem. Um, But, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there, there's that aspect of things too. Um, you know, it, some fighters, they get it, you know, whereas a lot of fighters, they, they can't really take a step back and realize that in order to book fights on the regional scene, which, you know, you're dealing with a small business in and of itself, right? Yeah. So, you know, at, at the amateur level, things are a little bit simpler, right? Mm-hmm. And we don't manage amateur fighters. My take on amateur fighting is take fights, win fights, get experience, take tough fights, grow mm. from them. Like padding your amateur record is a whole separate issue. It's one of the dumbest fucking things I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, one, once you're ready to go pro, you know, the game changes a little bit because, you know, you're getting compensated and some people have different ideas about what that's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some fighters, you know, need someone else there for a variety of reasons. But, you know, one of them, it, it, you know, diff, people get into management for like different reasons, right? Yeah. You know, some for some people it's a vanity thing. For some people it's a hobby thing. For some it's just strictly business mixed between all that stuff, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, uh, good management will, you know, get good opportunities for a fighter, but also kind of keep expectations grounded in reality. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're making a pro debut, and you can sell $40 worth of tickets, it's an unrealistic expectation to fight in your backyard and make thousands of dollars. Yeah. Um, some fighters think that, okay, I've been fighting for free as an amateur, so now I'm going pro. Man, now it's time to get paid. I'm not fighting for anything less than 2000 and 2000 in my pro debut mm-hmm. and you know, all this crazy stuff. And um, you know, they find it awfully hard uh, to, to, to really achieve that. And end up kind of pricing themselves out. So I think that, you know, it's like a, a good management arrangement between a fighter and a manager. You know, you have kind of an open dialogue between, you know, the fighter, management, coaches, you know, all that good stuff. And, you know, try to get everyone on the same page, have a reasonable set of expectations and what needs to happen kind of on every side of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and then kind of, you know, go from there and, um look to kind of ascend your way up through the regional circuit and ostensibly, you know, make your way up to a bigger show. Um, But, you know, for, for some fighters, there, there there's some fighters that get, you know, the self promotion thing, you know, they understand that stuff right out the gate uh, where some don't. And I think, you know, with that stuff too, you know, like management can be a good help with that and just kind of letting guys know, Hey, this isn't just strictly about your skill set or what you can do when you get in there. There's all mm-hmm. these other things and expectations that come with that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there needs to be some accountability on both ends. Um, okay. So let's so, go back to this. Yeah. So, sure. so you hear some fighters go, it's, it's, it's not my job to sell tickets. It's the, it's the promotion's job to sell tickets. So from, yeah. Europe, so from European, European <laughs> negotiations, is it, is it, is it, is it 50, 50, you know, where, where would you rank? Where would you rate the fighter's responsibility in, in like I said, in, in ticket sales? Is it, is it half the battle? Or should they should they sell all their tickets? Or how do you see it? Man, that's a great question, actually. 
Um, if you are fighting within a two hour radius of where you live, yeah, you know, if you're fighting multiple states away, it's a 10 hour drive, stuff like that, totally different story. Mm -hmm. But if you're fighting within a two hour radius of where you live, um, you should be expected to sell at minimum your weight and tickets, um, you know, as a pro. So let's say you're getting paid 500 and 500, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 500 to show 500. If you win, uh, you, you know, you should easily be able to sell a thousand dollars worth of tickets. And with your average ticket prices at most of these events, mm -hmm. that's anywhere from maybe 15 to 20, 25 ish tickets which if you have a few training partners you have a couple friends a couple family members they bring a plus one mm -hmm. that's very easily attainable even at just your general admission bottom level price mm -hmm. if you're a fighter that has a gym and even the smallest semblance of a support system mm -hmm. uh, that's a very reasonable expectation and you know it, it falls on both sides you know but a good promotion they're, they're already promoting their event they're already you know buying ads they're yeah. you know engaging with different media sources they're doing these different things you know putting their stuff out there on social media and what a lot of sometimes a lot of fighters don't really take into account is that if you're a pro fighter and you're making your pro debut or maybe you've had a, a fight or two you know and you're looking you need those opportunities to make your way up mm -hmm. a, a solid fight promotion even if it's at a smaller venue that's maybe not the fanciest or whatever you have these promoters spending easily, you know, 30, 40, 50 plus thousand dollars on a show, sometimes way more if you're in, you know, bigger stadiums or you have enhanced production costs due yeah. to broadcasting or whatever the case may be. You know, bef before a single ticket is sold, you know, a lot of these promotions are spending well into the five figures, upwards of six figures sometimes for events. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're getting sponsors, they're doing their part to sell tickets. But if you're like, a promotion survives partially like the, you know, the lifeblood of a, of a local show is a good chunk of, of it is fighter ticket sales, you know, mm -hmm. and, and fighters bringing fans locally to support local events. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a totally different set of expectations. If you're traveling five States away to fight, mm -hmm. then if you bring a couple friends and family members, that's a huge win. And, you know, most promotions would be over the moon that you brought six people yeah. you know, or 10 people when you're fighting five, six states away. Mm -hmm. But if you're local, you should absolutely be selling tickets. You know, mm -hmm. there are some regions in the country. And I know, you know, a lot of what you deal with and a lot of what people in the Southeast talk about is strictly the Southeast. So you've only got a few promotions that really operate in that space at the pro level, right? Yeah. You know, you've got 864, Conflict, NFC. Um, you know, you could consider Florida being part of the Southeast, but I mean, Really, in my opinion, that's a whole different region. Yeah. Um, I, I look at, I view the Southeast as Georgia, Tennessee, most of Tennessee, not even really even West Tennessee. That's kind of more mid South, like Memphis area and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, Tennessee, the Carolinas, South Carolina, North Carolina, maybe Virginia, maybe. Mm -hmm. And even then, that's kind of like an outlier. So you've only got a couple of promotions that even do pro fights right now in the Southeast, first off. Mm -hmm. And if fighters aren't selling tickets and those promotions go away, it'll be like it was in the old days where, you know, it was really hard for people to get fights sometimes because depending on where you were located, you know, you'd have to go halfway up a coast or something just to even get a fight, yeah. much less. I mean, the, the terribly low amount of money you get paid, if at all, um, you know, and, the, and in other regions, if you're not committing to sell a certain amount of tickets, you won't even get a fight. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, one of my very good friends uh, in this business, John Rollo, he's a great dude, uh, promoter of Shogun Fights. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked with him off and on, too, on helping him with, you know, some matches. And, you know, uh, he did a show uh, recently uh, this year in uh, South Florida at the Hard Rock Casino mm -hmm. in Hollywood, Florida. And, um, you know, I helped him out with that stuff, too. Um, he's very blunt with guys. He's just like, listen, if you're not going to do your part and, you know, at least sell – you know, you're waiting more worth of tickets when you're fighting 30 minutes down the road and I'm spending almost six figures just to even put on this event for you to fight. Mm -hmm. I can't use you, yeah. you know, and, and go up to PA, go up to New Jersey for CFFC or some of these other shows and tell those promotions, Hey, you know, I just fight. It's the promotions job to promote and sell tickets. Mm-hmm. 
you know, you won't be fighting on those shows. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll be buying a ticket mm -hmm. to go in and watch them. Um, you know, I, I don't think that that's an unreasonable expectation. And in most other parts of the country, if you're a local fighter, there's the expectation that you're selling tickets so the promotion isn't losing money on a local fighter when sometimes they might have to bring in an out-of-town opponent for you mm -hmm. because you're at a weight class that doesn't have a lot of depth mm -hmm. or maybe between your training situation and then who you've already fought as an amateur, there aren't any more local opponent options for you. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, uh, you know, I've, I've explained that to quite a few of our guys over time is that just, hey, you know, you look at it strictly from a fighter pay perspective, but this is a small business mm -hmm. that most of the time, if you're having a successful show on the regional scene, you're not walking away with hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars. You're walking away with, you know, uh, you know, four figures, you know, low five figures. Uh, yeah. You know, if you have a bunch of insurance claims and you pay out a bunch of deductibles, that could easily go down to where you're just like, hey, what little profits I have, I'm putting back into the business and I'll take my wife out to a nice fancy Waffle House dinner <laughs> and, uh, you know, whatever. So, you know, I've had to explain that to guys too. I'm just like, listen, if you can only sell a couple grand worth of tickets and the promotion is going to have to bring in an opponent from a couple states away, mm -hmm. you know, if you have this purse, then the opponent has to get paid a certain amount. Then you mm -hmm. factor in travel and hotel. What you're asking for, even at best, is going to cause the promotion to lose probably $2,000 on your fight, mm -hmm. which isn't a reasonable expectation you know, on a show in and show out basis from all these different fights. So, you know, it's like, I, I'm all about both sides doing their part and, and, mm -hmm. and some promotions don't do their part when that happens. That's a shame. But in my experience, most promotions that put on shows and stick around, you know, they're, they're doing everything that is within their power, you know, to go and sell tickets, but the, the fighters locally, are an important part of that, you know, and I think fighter pay is kind of something that gets debated on the regional scene a lot. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, I, I am going to mention a specific promotion here that I feel like gets some flack sometimes. And, and it's, you know, I don't feel like it's really deserved, but um, you know, the NFC, you know, a long time Georgia promotion, you know, David yeah. Oblis has been mm -hmm. carrying the torch for Georgia MMA for a very, very long time, mm -hmm. you know, um, he has his pay scale. Certain promotions have a pay scale that they stick to. The LFA is, you know, pretty similar, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, uh, you know, some people don't really like that. But the thing is, you know, for, I mean, there are quite a few time periods over the years to where you look at it. And the NFC was the only show consistently doing a good amount of pro fights in Georgia. Mm -hmm. You know, like it is absolutely in a hundred percent. David Oblis is right to scale his business how he sees fit mm -hmm. in a way that he knows he can continue, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, and, and I've, I've seen people bash them online and I just don't really think that that's fair mm -hmm. because, you know, they've been, I mean, there have been so many guys that have come through that show that they owe a decent chunk of their career opportunities that got them to a certain point to that promotion. Yeah, and it, it's just kind of shitty when guys turn around and 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 then trash that same promotion that gave them so many opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and some of it too goes back to the ticket sales. You know, it's like if you can sell ten grand worth of tickets, you know, you can absolutely negotiate a higher purse. Mm -hmm. And if you're just like, hey, I want to get paid because I'm trying to make money. I live down the street, but I'm gonna sell four hundred dollars worth of tickets. Yeah. You know, I mean, after a certain point, you got to sit back and look at it and realize like, hey, you know, I need an opportunity. But at the same time, I'm basically asking this pro promotion to kind of bend over, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, just take a, a pretty solid L on my fight. Um, well, so I, I, I go, go ahead. Let me check in for a second. So, sure. so, so you made a very good, clear understanding of where the mistakes are being made when it comes to what a fighter thinks. You know, yeah. so that's that's true. A lot of fighters say, "Hey, I'm just here to fight." You yeah. know, and they think because they can fight, they're worth a certain amount of money. Mm -hmm. But there, but what's the, there is no education on on being a fighter. You can go to any job. You got on the job training. Yep, yep. You know, you know what your pay scale is. If you're an entry level person at a job, your pay scale is this. After a year, your pay scale is this, so on and so on and so forth. 
but there is no fighter training that teaches a fighter to understand what they're worth. So they yeah. think because they're flashy, because they can knock out a couple of people, that they're automatically worth what they're worth. So at least Dave Obelis will come out and go, this is the tier. This is where we're yeah. you can yeah. fight, yes or no. But then, like I said, you know, using the example of, of A64, uh, to my knowledge, that was never outlined. And a lot of money was thrown out to a lot of fighters early. So now they think, okay, well, well, if this is what they're paying, then this is what I should be getting. But then you get, when you get fighters, like you said, they're coming from overseas that have no way of selling tickets on the local scene. Mm -hmm. on, and then if your pay-per-view is not establishing and working well, people are not buying pay-per-views, what do you do then? You know what yeah. I'm mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, uh, I mean, you said it. I, I think that the, the NFC, um, you know, and their pay scale and basically the way they just break it down, like, hey, if you have mm – -hmm. if you're a one-fight pro – you're in this pay scale. If you're, you know, the next tier up, so on and so forth. Yeah. You know, if you're the co-main event, you get X amount. If you're the main mm -hmm. event, you get this. Um, you know, obviously exceptions can be made for guys who are bigger draws or, you know, enhanced commission structure, you know, whatever the case may be. But, um, you know, I, I think with 864, um, you know, I mean, it's they're still a relatively new promotion. And mm -hmm. maybe when they came out, they didn't really establish a baseline pay structure. Mm -hmm. And that's ha that's been something that's had to kind of get under control and evolve over time as far as to like, OK, you know, this guy is maybe getting paid X, whereas this guy who has more experience is getting paid, you know, around the same or whatever. So a lot of that stuff had to get kind of under control and, and really kind of scaled into, you know, what they're doing now, which I think they're trying to kind of simplify things and, yeah. um, you know, keep things a little more uniform. Um, and, and, you know, the education, too, you know. It, it comes from different places, you know, maybe some gyms have more experienced pro fighters that can mm. kind of, you know, break off some knowledge to the younger cats coming up, mm. uh, you know, coaches, trainers, you know, management, um, you know, can all kind of explain things. Like for me personally, I tell guys this in the very first conversation that I have with a fighter about us even potentially working together. Yeah. I say, Hey, you know, I will never sell you short. Mm -hmm. I will never sell you short ever. You know, I will, you know, I, I tell people oftentimes that I, I will be in a territory with some promotions that, you know, where we're at now, they're like, hey, we like Dave. Dave is good people. Mm -hmm. And if I push it too much further, they're going to be like, you know what, Dave, go fuck yourself. I'm not talking to you anymore. Yeah. And, you know, so, you know, it's like I'll always try to get the best, mm -hmm. you know, for a client in whatever situation that may be. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, things need to be grounded in reality. And I tell people you know, don't be one of those guys that gets overly hung up about money and you price yourself out of fights that are otherwise very good yeah. to potentially advance your career mm -hmm. and you cost yourself W's or opportunities or you just chase nothing but money and, you know, you take fights against nothing but killers, right? Yeah. And, you, you know, you win some and you lose some, mm -hmm. you know, okay, yeah, maybe you had a couple extra hundred dollars on your show money mm -hmm. on, in one fight versus the other. But if after four or five years, let's say you're 10 and seven, you fought nothing but killers, you know, mm -hmm. much respect. But at the end of the day, I mean, you're 10 and seven, 10 and eight, you know, strength of schedule is great. Mm -hmm. But with that kind of record, you've essentially cemented yourself into a very tough ringer status kind of regional journey, man. And you're never going to get a sniff of a big show unless it's maybe an undercard, you know, that you get a local opportunity for. Yeah. You know, like a Bellator where you're just, you know, there to, you know, fill a spot and put butts in seats. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I try to tell guys like, hey, you know, like there's a reasonable expectation and, and being a fighter, it's not like a union job to where it's like due to tenure, you know, your pay goes up and up or you get yeah. to a certain experience level or certain certification level or something. And so you have an automatic pay increase. Like on the regional scene, there is absolutely a cap on pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that tends to be kind of in the low to mid to maybe high teens, you know, say 1,700 and 1,700 or mm -hmm. 1,850 and 1,850 or just those are hypothetical examples. Yeah. But yeah. most regional pay up to and including, say, Titan FC or LFA title fights, you know, other mm -hmm. things, you tend to cap out right at that level. It's not really, um, you know – the LFA and Titan FC can pay guys pretty well. 864 is, mm. you know, known for kind of having a little bit of a higher pay scale 
than yeah. some of these other, you know, regional organizations. Um, but all the same, you hit a cap. Mm -hmm. Your pay just doesn't keep going up just because you have seven fights or 10 fights or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's like at that point, do you get overly fixated on just, man, I'm, I'm just trying to make more money. Um, or, or do you get good opportunities and try to get those wins that are going to, you know, help progress you? Um, you know, I think that's the thing that some guys get hung up on that if they don't have someone that can try to, you know, reel them back in a little bit, yeah. um, you know, things can get a little squirrely sometimes. And that's why you see some guys that like, you're like record wise, you look at it and they're like, man, like, why is this guy not fighting for titles or, mm -hmm. you know, making his way up? And it's because, mm -hmm. you know, you see them posting on forums and they're like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Here's my record. I'm not fighting for anything less than $10,000, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, well, you're not in a big show here in the U S so mm -hmm. you really won't be fighting for $10,000 here in, in a small regional organization, mm -hmm. you know, for your show money, especially. So, you know, you've effectively priced yourself out. Um, but I think for fighters, you know, just for them to have people around them, whether it's, you know, teammates, trainers, management, mm -hmm. whatever, just to also kind of level set sometimes. And the news can't always be good. You know, it's yeah. like sometimes you're going to have to accept the fact that, you know, you've kind of capped out pay wise mm -hmm. in a certain promotion. And does that impact your decision? Or do you still take the fight for what it is and just realize that when you're coming up, wins and, and good wins over you know experienced guys as you continue to make your way up that's actually the more valuable currency than holding out for an extra 500 bucks or something mm -hmm. yeah and then you don't end up getting a fight period mm -hmm. okay so let's go back into you know the role of a manager okay so now yeah. now let's go into scenarios like i said i know uh we seen on Facebook. You see me chime in on it. Um, mm -hmm. Ryan Hollis, to uh, to my yes. knowledge, I think he does his own. His, his, he does his mm -hmm. own contract, and or he or um, maybe Carl, uh, not Carl, um, Roger Carroll may 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 pitch in. You know, saying, but for the most mm -hmm. part, the way the story goes, he he went on Facebook and he said um, he has to do his his amount and ticket sales and pay per view buys to be able to get his full fighter purse. You know, you as a manager and you're negotiating a contract, is that part of the contract to where, you know, you definitely have to sell these, these many ready in stone or you don't get your, your, um, your, your uh, show money and your, and your win money or how, how does that play in your world? Sure. So it, it depends on, you know, the, the region, the location, if that's kind of standard in contracts, mm -hmm. you know, further up, you know, say once you get into, you know, uh, you know, Philly, New Jersey, you know, that area, you know, you will have ticket guarantees in most contracts for local fighters anyway, not for mm -hmm. out of town fighters, but for local guys, yeah. um, you know, to, you know, Hey, if you're going to, you know, get paid, you know, 2000 and 2000, you need to sell, you know, 4,000 and a little bit of change worth of tickets or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, but you have to understand and know what you're signing up for if that's attainable and, and, what are the circumstances surrounding that? So with Ryan Hollis, I don't know really where he's from at the moment, but by my understanding, he was coming and training and staying with Roger Carroll at his gym. Yeah. Um, and, you know, different stories kind of go around. I, I heard, you know, uh, uh, a bit about that situation in terms of just that they had asked Ryan not to sell his – full purse value which you know is full mm -hmm. purse value for a title fight if they're paying five thousand and five thousand that's 10k worth of tickets and yeah i mean don't get me wrong we've got some guys up here who sell several times that amount mm -hmm. but you know for every one of those guys there's a guy who you know is selling considerably less than that but all the same if you're selling you know 50 75 100 tickets mm -hmm. you're still a stud at the regional level like that's yeah. great yeah. um but you know for a fighter that's normally coming from five plus states away or whatever, you know, that's really not a reasonable expectation to mm -hmm. sell, you know, that much in tickets because it's just not really attainable. Yeah. Um, so for either side, why even bother with that? But, you know, if you're coming in and you're training at a gym that's right down the road, you know, I don't think it's an unreasonable, like, unreasonable expectation for, you know, the gym that you're training out of that has fighters that have been selling tickets locally have a proven track record of that, mm -hmm. you know, okay, you've got this out of town fighter that's coming in doing a training camp at your gym. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Can your gym sell the equivalent of, you know, 30 or 40 tickets or, you know, 30 tickets in a table or something like that, which isn't even the full extent of what fighters from that gym have sold in the past. Yeah. That's a perfectly reasonable expectation. And by my understanding, that's where they ended up at was not like the full purse value, yeah. but just something like just mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And that's a very reasonable expectation. If your gym is down the road and in the past, you know, for shows within a several hour radius, you sold a couple tables and some tickets or, mm -hmm. you know, you sold a bunch of tickets and, you know, a table or two. Uh, that's not unreasonable to yeah. ask that when you're paying a fighter, you know, who's coming out of that gym, you know, a very substantial amount of money. Mm -hmm. I think that that's perfectly reasonable. Um, I think that, you know, you just need to come up with something that's a common sense solution, you know, mm -hmm. between kind of, you know, the full purse value and zero. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, my, my thing, which I'm sure maybe you were going to ask about at some point was I don't believe in like airing out grievances or mm -hmm. airing out negotiations in public mm -hmm. it's one of the dumbest things you can do because yeah. then it just it, it 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 adds so much time into that situation because you're going to be getting contacted by all these you know outside people mm -hmm. you know and you're going to be sucked into the you know vortex of facebook comments and other things with people tagging you and then before yeah. you know it the situation that could have maybe taken a couple hours out of your time has now sucked out 15 hours in a week Mm -hmm. you know, and, and potentially, and, and that just gets kind of ridiculous. It's like, you know, negotiations are meant to be, you know, at least in some part confidential, Yeah. you know, and, and if you have an issue, you know, try to intelligently and respectfully address that with whoever it is you're negotiating, whether it's a fight promotion or, you know, whatever the case may be. I don't believe in doing that it, on part of either the promotion mm -hmm. or the fighter. And I've seen both sides in that equation in the past air out, Mm -hmm. people's dirty laundry and it's just unprofessional it's a bad look yeah. um you know that's one to where it's like i don't know if hollis has a manager or a coach that functions in that role but um you know if that was me or plenty of other people on this side of the business that i know mm -hmm. he would have gotten a text that says hey what are you doing mm -hmm. take that down like mm -hmm. you're just further complicating the situation when it doesn't need to go that route it's just a really unprofessional look and on top of that it's going to broadcast out there to other promotions to potentially not work with you mm -hmm. because you're basically putting it out there that, Hey, the minute we have a disagreement, I'm going to go out and air everything publicly, you know, on social media, whether it's video or not. So, you know, that can give other promotions hesitation to work with that fighter mm -hmm. because what if they don't see eye to eye and then all of a sudden this guy's giving just his version of the story Mm -hmm. uh, which maybe he doesn't have a correct interpretation of what the expectations are because it hasn't been adequately explained to him. And then all of a sudden what's getting put out there in public may not even be the real situation. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And even if there were unreasonable expectations, it's still just, it's a bad look. You just shouldn't do that. Um, but, you know, well, you, made, you made a good point that yeah. somebody who doesn't have a manager may not understand the full picture as it's written, you know, yeah. and that's easy. That's easy to be the case. Yeah. To a contract. If you're some guy in the block who, who just has a skill set to fight, but you're just an mm -hmm. average guy, you may not be able to understand, you know, all the nuances of what goes into a contract and what, sure. you know, what percentages mean of how many tickets equal, equals this. You may you may not be mm -hmm. clueless, but you may be you may be clueless. But unfortunately, we also live in the social media world of, you know, you know, your fan base gauges your success. So if yeah. you're not on Facebook talking your noise, making making fans, getting mm -hmm. people on your side, and you know we we call the social media public opinion, you know of what you're doing or what you're going through. Sometimes sure. people go out there just to cry to get support. You know what I'm saying? I've seen some yeah. people who, who put up crowdfunding pages and say, "Hey, support me because I'm in this, 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 and this," and they get money. So unfortunately, you can't you can't exclude social media. Now you can gauge how you go about it, but to not use it, a lot of people don't even know how to do that now. They, they have to do something. Yeah, do yeah. I mean, social, yeah, it's definitely a part of it, but I mean, at, at the same time, I, you know, just kind of going back to what I said, I mean, you know, negotiations are kind of like, you know, things stall out and people are yeah. on different sides of the fence, like, you know, going and kind of, you know, beating your chest on social media publicly mm -hmm. isn't really a strategy that's going to endear you to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. 
so let's so let's so let's reverse it. So now, sure, let's switch gears. I just saw a recent post um, also on Facebook about a contract with um with Mata. What's up? What's Mata's mm -hmm. first name? Uh, Nicholas. Nicholas Mata. Okay, yeah. and and the way I'm I'm only going on what's read it was written. I actually don't know the contract or how it was mm -hmm. negotiated. I'm just reading how it was written. And basically they were saying his contract was um, uh, 2,000 to show, 200 to win, and he had to sell 100 pay-per-view buys to get his show money. Then if what he didn't sell in pay-per-view buys was taking out of his show money. Now, um, you know, um, I, I could probably find the post, but I'm just, I mean, kind of going over the highlights of, of, of that actual post. I'm about to say who posted it. But if that's even remotely true, it was actually a sound, a signed contract. Hey, hold on, hold on just one second, man, okay? Okay. Uh, I'll be right back. Okay. okay. Sorry, my, uh, my, my, my boss just needed my attention for a second. Oh, no problem. So, so, but, uh, uh, so, so going back to the last part, so – even if how I stated it is is remotely true, mm -hmm. is would you even as a manager would you even sign that contract? I'm just being curious. Of course, you have to answer, but I'm just curious. Would you even consider that a good contract to sign that you will lose most of your show money if you can't sell tickets and you sign it? So if he if he doesn't uh, if he doesn't sell because actually how it was written, you know, actually I take it back. It was actually on a um, the commission of Georgia actually went through the contract openly. I think the manager had a problem with it. And he mm -hmm. even said Mata only sold three pay-per-view buys. So the remaining hundred pay-per-view buys had to come out of his, his show purse. Yeah. I mean, I would say in short, you know, just as kind of a precursor to what I'll, I'll elaborate on afterwards. Um, you know, I, I think Bishop Bullwinkle said it best, uh, with his song, uh, Hell Nah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you know, yeah, it's that signing a contract with those terms is just a terrible idea for a variety of reasons. Like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a promotion or broadcaster, and, and over the years I've dealt with, you know, Go Fight Live, you know, Fight TV, yeah. uh, just a host of these other internet pay per view broadcasters and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the way that you can do a contract like that with a ticket minimum is a little different than you, you can really do with a pay-per-view buy because, you know, for example, like it was cage ticks. Now it's nitro tickets or nitro yeah. ticks or something. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, one of the best ticket platforms out there to use for, you know, local MMA shows and stuff, because they also allow back end access for the fighters. So the fighter can go in and log in and check mm -hmm. out, Hey, how many people have bought tickets with my code? Yeah. who those people are mm -hmm. and if there's discrepancies you know he can say hey john smith and you know his wife bought you know vip tickets but they're not showing all my thing then you can mm -hmm. go in address that with the promoter mm -hmm. get credit um it's it's very hard to assess that with a pay-per-view you know model right yeah. uh you know with internet pay-per-view you know services and stuff i've never seen that work out um you know, and, you know, and this is something that I actually talked with 864 about, too, I guess, after their show, they kind of explained, you know, what, what happened and, mm -hmm. you know, the terms and everything like that. Um, you know, it's just very hard for them to even, because even for promotions, too, I've been on the promotional side of things as like a matchmaker and other stuff. Yeah. And I've dealt with this to mm -hmm. where, you know, the numbers that the pay-per-view company says that you did versus what you actually did are sometimes different. Yeah. And I caught a pay-per-view company that's now no longer in business um, ripping a promotion that I was working for at the time off mm -hmm. hardcore, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it, on a variety of levels like that just really doesn't make sense. Like, and I understand why uh, in that situation, they, the promotion offered that contract because, you know, they're, they're already kind of over budget fighter wanted to get on the, the show. And, you know, they're just like, Hey, you know, if you can sell some tickets or some pay-per-views, Let's work it out like this. And, you know, to be honest, um, you know, I understand why the promotion would offer those terms mm -hmm. because it's a way that basically makes it like, hey, we can't really afford this purse or this fight right now on, on the show. But if you can essentially just cover your cost, 
then cool. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Um, I get that aspect of things, and but really it kind of falls on the fighter. And and if the fighter isn't really as up on you know what that contract meant or the contents of it, it really falls on his management. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like what the fuck are you doing? Like that that that's stupid. I mean, like why why you would contractually obligate your fighter to an almost assuredly unattainable situation contractually mm-hmm. is beyond me. Like I have no idea why you would do that. And you know, I, I, I would never obligate one of our clients to something that couldn't even be verified. Yeah. You know, like, like really even by the promotion, mm-hmm. you know, like how, how, like even on the promotional side of things, it's hard to tell what your numbers are or who use what codes or whatever, because a lot of the time, times these like systems will botch that stuff. Mm-hmm. There, there isn't the same level of accountability, um, you know, that you can get with, you know, some of these ticket websites, you know, where you can use a, a drop down menu or, mm-hmm. you know, a promo code. So really it, it falls on his management for just negotiating him a stupid contract that was, you know, unachievable for the fighter Mm -hmm. from inception really and then you know if you're going to enforce that contract to the letter you're basically setting your 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 guy up to fail Mm -hmm. um you know or you're you know being you know just silly and naive and 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 expecting the promotion to just not enforce the contract Mm -hmm. and, and just oh hey whatever we'll just pay you your show money and your win money and forget the terms that we negotiated or whatever. Cause I mean, with a ticket minimum, like let's say you're fighting for a promotion up in New Jersey at a casino in Atlantic city mm-hmm. and you're given a guarantee uh, in your contract. Like, Hey, I commit to selling $4,000 worth of tickets. Mm-hmm. If you don't sell $4,000 worth of tickets digitally and with paper tickets, guess what? That money is being deducted from your pay. Yeah. You know, that that's how that works, you mm-hmm. know, and to expect anything different when it's outlined in your contract, that's stupid, mm-hmm. you know, and, 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 and as a manager, why you sign your guy up for something mm-hmm. that is so hard, if not impossible to actually even achieve or account for mm-hmm. is stupidity. Yes. And I think that's what I heard in, in, in reading the post and listening that, mm-hmm. you know, it was deducted from his purse if he didn't sell these many tickets. But going at, going at it from a promotion side, mm-hmm. what is the upside to that? So I get it. So say you make this master card and you got all these great fighters on there and the card mm-hmm. is, is, is a winner. Sure. But, but none of the fighters, you know, reach their ticket or pay-per-view obligations. So none of them hardly gets paid, even though the promotion may have done well from their end on ticket sales, you would never mm-hmm. get that card again because people no. go, hey, I'm not going to be able to do that. So I can't fight on your card. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I, that, 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 that nice card again, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That, that's, that's why, you know, I think that, you know, there are some promotions in different parts of the country that the majority of fighters fighting on the pro portion, or if it's an all pro card, mm-hmm. just the card in general are fighting on ticket guarantees but you have to have a clear set of expectations and understanding as far as to what's expected and mm-hmm. then also what is attainable. Like mm-hmm. you have to know like, Hey, I think I'm capable of selling 50 tickets or mm-hmm. 80 tickets or mm-hmm. tickets slash pay-per-views. But really you can't count on the pay-per-view stuff because there, there's several different ways that that stuff can kind of go astray. And, and then it just, it, it signs you up for a bad situation yeah. and you should just, you just shouldn't even get there with the pay-per-view stuff. It's, it's an ancillary revenue stream, Mm -hmm. but in terms you don't, you, you're not going to have the same level of accountability Mm -hmm. that you have with ticket sales. So don't sign up for it. And if that's the only offer you have from a certain promotion uh, is, you know, an kind of almost untenable situation to where it's very hard for you to account for which of your fans are buying pay-per-views or not, Mm -hmm. because it's so much harder to track than tickets don't take that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Don't okay. negotiate yourself that contract or negotiate yourself maybe a lesser, you know, rate of pay mm-hmm. and get that clause out of the contract if you aren't abundantly confident that you can achieve it. Yeah. 
Um, but again, that falls back on whoever uh, Mata's management is um, for just putting him in a situation to where, you know, he pretty much kind of had a gun to his head already. Yeah. And, um, you know, you're basically just kind of hoping that the person holding the gun just has a brain fart and doesn't pull the trigger. I mean, like, I, you know, okay, that's uh, just silly, man. And I really feel for Nicholas Mata because, you know, he probably, uh, from what I understand, the situation was explained to him differently. Mm-hmm. And maybe he didn't have the greatest comprehension of the yeah. stuff that was in his contract. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's a shame, you know, like yeah. he, I've met him once. He's a nice kid. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, I mean, why you sign yourself up for that when you've got to be at least tangentially aware that that's just not a situation that you can. It's attainable. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like at that point, you're just, you're setting your fighter up to fail mm-hmm. um, and then end up being stuck in a very funky situation. Like why bother yeah. at that point, just get a fight somewhere else mm-hmm. or, you know, or have a different rate of pay or just do something else. Um, yeah. I, I just, I, when I heard about that, it was very sad. I, you know, it sucks to hear and see that he's stuck in that situation, yeah. but uh, just, that, yeah, that, that was just incredibly dumb, in my opinion. Well, let me ask you this. Let's say you, since you've been around, since actually you've been around, you're still around in the game from the highest level of, yep. of a packed Holloway mm-hmm. to, to the bare minimums of a, of a fighter just, you know, making their debut. Yep. How do you see the sport, since, you're, since you have a broad spectrum, how yeah. do you see the sport of MMA right now? What are some of the problems that are still current today from when you started – and what do you think has changed, in your opinion, in the sport? I think overall, fighter pay as a whole, at the lower end of the spectrum, has gone up a little bit. Yeah. You know, for, for like, not like mid-level guys, but like for making a pro debut, I remember when, you know, a lot of guys were getting paid two and two mm-hmm. hundred, you yeah. know, 200 to show, 200 to win, 250, 250, mm-hmm. maybe three and three. In a lot of places, that's gone up a little bit. Yeah. So your bottom level pay is kind of, uh, you know, in a lot of places, it's kind of stabilized around, you know, like our guys, you know, make pro debuts for 400 and 400. Mm-hmm. You know, like if we're working with you and you're a Sucker Punch client and you're going to make your pro debut on a small show somewhere, you'll be getting at least 400 and 400. Okay. You know, the lower end of the spectrum has gone up a little bit. Yeah. And some promotions, especially the ones that are, you know, very long time stalwarts, like, you know, your NFC mm-hmm. or, you know, CFFC up in Jersey, yeah. IT fight series in Ohio, you know, Valor fights, B3 fights over in Memphis with um, my dude, Nick Harmeyer and Jason Letterfine, you know, those guys, promotions that have stood the test of time mm-hmm. and been around for, you know, years to where at this point, they're a pretty well oiled machine chugging along and nothing's really going to stop it at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, the pay in a lot of those places is, is solid and comparable mm-hmm. to what's attainable in most other parts of the country. So I'd say at the lower end of the spectrum, the pay has gone up a little bit compared to what it used to be. Okay. Um, the For your mid-level guys, titles, you know, you tend to be around the, you know, one and one to two and two range for the most part. Some promotions based on ticket sales or, mm-hmm. you know, just a fighter's record or just other choices with that mm-hmm. kind of stuff might pay more, but that tends to be kind of the range that you're in. Um, but I, I'd say the state of regional MMA is relatively healthy in most places. You have a fair amount of shows now. Mm-hmm. You know, guys have opportunities in some places. There's almost too many opportunities because there's so many competing shows, like yeah. say up in Pennsylvania, you know, Jersey area, mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, f- shows are fighting over fighters. Yeah. You know, and what yes. ticket sellers they can get. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I would say that I think we're in a better place now for regional MMA than mm-hmm. we have been, you know, in, in years past. You know, I mean, even, you know, say in Maryland and stuff, you've got one of the most consistent and very quietly one of the biggest and best regional promotions in the country, uh, you know, Shogun Fights with my dude John Rollo. Mm-hmm. Uh, much respect to him. You know, real big tatted up dude holding it down in the fight game. So mm-hmm. much respect there. But, uh, you know, John, he does the big arena in Baltimore several times a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's done shows in the, you know, MGM Grand Casino that's uh, you know, just got built. Mm-hmm. 
uh, right across the river from DC. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you, you've got like guys have consistent opportunities to fight, which is something that in the years past, it was really tough. I mean, guys yeah. in certain states, mm -hmm. they had to go a state or two away just to even get any kind of real pro opportunities. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that the regional scene is, is in a pretty good spot. Um, you know, there are more opportunities popping up at, at the pro level too. You know, you've got the LFA is doing very well. Titan FC is up and running again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got Invicta out there for, you know, female fighters. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and TKO up in Canada has come back in a big way. They're on Fight Pass. And, yeah. uh, you know, that's the show that, you know, guys like George St. Pierre and Patrick Cote came up mm -hmm. in before mm -hmm. they got into the UFC. And there's a host of, you know, international opportunities too. And at the highest level, you know, the PFL is making some big waves, you know, like guys are making very good money there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Bellator is putting on great events and obviously you've got the UFC, but yeah. um, I think for a fighter, it is a much better time overall to be making your way up and getting into a bigger show than it, it was, you know, say, you know, five years ago or, you know, some of these other time periods where you've gone through like big lulls and down mm -hmm. swings of opportunity. Okay. I want to use this time. Cause like I said, I, I deal with fighters on all the levels. We talk about, you know, sure. their goals. We talk about marketing, promotion, so blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, blah. But what I'm getting the most of is, I don't want to say delusion, <laughs> you know, but they, they, they really think their value is here in the sport when they don't realize mm -hmm. it's here. So yeah. I want you to use this time as a manager. Can you explain what you look for in a fighter and how you explain their value in the sport as being a client? Like, you know, our goal is to get you here. But you mm -hmm. need to explain to them where you're at right now so you understand how you're going to get paid is based off how the market sees you. Can you explain that from your point of view if you can? Sure, yeah. Um, so it, when you're coming up, your, you know, value to a mm -hmm. promotion is, you know, part talent, you know, part social media presence at this point. Like, do you promote yourself? Do you market yourself as a fighter? Are mm -hmm. you going to promote your fights and therefore, by extension, hopefully sell tickets? Yeah. And just directly what your ticket sales are, mm -hmm. um, you know, so it's not strictly just talent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all, all the other stuff comes into play, too, you know, especially if you're buying for local opportunities and you're the guy who's just like, hey, I train, I fight, I don't do social media, I'm not trying to sell tickets, I'm just trying to fight. You could be great. Mm -hmm. like you could be Anderson, future Anderson Silva type great, right? Mm -hmm but you'll most likely lose out on opportunities to a guy with potentially a below 500 record. Mm. But if he sells 50 tickets for most local promotions, that's going to be a pretty easy choice. Yeah. Um, your, your value when you're coming up as a pro fighter is a mix of your talent, your marketability, what you do to promote yourself. Um, and then your ability to sell tickets or pay-per-views yeah. or at least just bring exposure. Mm. Um, Obviously, the expectations for ticket sales are different if, say, you live in Florida, but you're fighting in Texas. Yeah. You know, uh, you're not being expected to sell a bunch of tickets. And if somehow you manage to, you're a stud and you're awesome. Mm -hmm. But, like, it's, uh, it's kind of a mix of those different things. And, and so for promotion, and I've dealt with this on the promotional side of, of things too, you know, matchmaking and doing different things. Um, if you know a guy is coming from out of town and he can't sell a bunch of tickets, but you know, at least he's promoting himself on social media, mm -hmm. you know, he, he's, he's, he's sharing his fight poster and sharing some training stuff and, mm -hmm. and promoting the fact that he's fighting coming up, you know, Hey, fighting coming up on May 10th at V3 fights, you know, come watch me fight, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Even if the guy doesn't sell you a million tickets, he's still getting his fight out there. He's still getting the promotion out there. He's doing his part. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes that's all you can do because you're not going to sell a ton of tickets yeah. due to location or whatever. But, you know, that's kind of what your worth is, is a hybrid mix of those three factors. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not strictly based on talent. And if you're not willing to address, you know, kind of those other aspects of things, you could lose out on opportunities or just not get opportunities in general compared to other guys who might not be half as good as you. Yeah. But 
you know, they post on social media more than once every eight months. Mm. And, you know, they're actually out there trying to promote themselves. Mm. So that's kind of what, you know, your worth is coming up as a regional fighter is a mix of all those things. Yeah. You know, a promotion doesn't want to just shell out money for a card full of guys that won't promote themselves because that's unsustainable. They mm. won't sell enough tickets and it just won't work. Even a quarter of your card being kind of duds in that respect can have mm. really real consequences for a promotion financially. Yeah. So, you know, you as a fighter, you kind of just need to know like, hey, you know, for any type of job or career field, there's a certain set of expectations as far as, you know, what my duties are, what things I need to do performance wise, what qualifications I need. You know, um, I've always thought that, you know, the, some of the stuff that guys do as far as, you know, like uh, underwater welding and all mm. this other stuff was really cool. But I can't do that right now. I'd go and I'd, I'd drown or do some other fucked up shit and I'd die. But, mm. um, you know, but you have to go through and you have to get, you know, those certifications or you have to go and, and be capable of performing the duties in order to get paid. You yeah. know what I mean? And that's kind of where regional fighters are at is just that, like, there is expectations and you don't have to sell 100 tickets. Not everyone can, yeah. you know, but just understand where you're at. And with most, most promotions, you can absolutely find a middle ground mm -hmm. somewhere that, you know, you can work something out that works for both sides, gets the fighter a good opportunity, but also doesn't leave the promotion just getting taken to the house. Yeah, I got you. So is there a criteria for you as a recruiter and manager when you're looking for talent? What do you look for? Uh, talent's part of it, um, but it's not the end all be all really either because there are plenty of talented dudes, but if you just don't understand the other aspects of how this, you know, business kind of functions, you know, it may not be a good fit, you know, or if just, you know, the talent may be there, but just on a moral and personal level, you're kind of morally bankrupt and stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe we're not the guys for you. You know what I mean? We, yeah. we, we like to have good relationships with our clients. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to work with people that, you know, want to work with us that we can also believe in and, you know, know that they're not going to be out going out on the weekends and, you know, slapping a bunch of people and, you know, getting, mm -hmm. you know, physical with the ladies and just, you know, other stuff. Um, you know, and, and by no means does that mean that people have to be a saint either. You know, it's just, yeah. you know, people make mistakes. I mean, this sport is full of guys who had, you know, criminal records and, you know, had, you know, stints in jail, prison, whatever. And, and, and through fighting, they found themselves and, you know, really changed their lives and moved on. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, we've got, you know, we've got plenty, I mean, not, you know, a ton, but we do have guys on our roster who may have had legal issues in the past and, um, you know, but they got through that stuff. They paid their debt to society, whatever that was. And now they're, you know, living good lives and, and doing their thing. Um, you know, but for us, you know, it's, it's part talent and also part, you know, just, is it going to be a good fit personality wise and, you know, uh, just personally. Um, but you know, we, we do obviously look for talented guys. Um, and also guys who tested themselves, you know, there's nothing worse or more unpredictable than this, a kid who, you know, fluffed up his amateur record, never really mm -hmm. fought anybody. So it's like, yeah, okay, he's 13 and 0 as an amateur as an amateur, but he only beat two people with a winning record. Yeah. You know, that's usually not what we're going for. We're looking for people who are like really about it mm -hmm. and uh, you know, as they move up the pro ranks and stuff or down to take real fights and you know, challenge themselves and then uh, you know, ostensibly make the jump to the big show and and be ready for that. Um all right, so let me ask you this. Um, yeah. Give us some of the problems that you go through as a manager when trying to, like I said, you know, fighting is a spectator sport. So which sure. means, you know, fans got to get in the seats, fans got to enjoy it, they got to want to buy the ticket. What are some of the problems you run across in getting fighters on good promotions and, you know, being able to get them seen and moving up in the ranks and all that kind of good stuff? Or is that strictly your job to place them in the right venue so that they can move over the ranks? Or is it just to get them a good fight? Did I, did I you know, quickly? Did you get what I said? You get, you get what I yeah, mean? yeah, no, I, I totally okay. get what you mean. So, okay. yeah, it, it's kind of sad that we're at that point now. But, um, you know, it, it's 
nowadays with some fights, it's like you kind of have to look at like, okay, not just is the fight, you know, uh, a good, you know, test or a good potential scalp for a client, but also, you know, is it a fight that, you know, makes sense for them afterwards? You know, it's uh, you see some guys really early, like say if a guy's two and zero, and he just takes a crazy fight and he fights this guy eight and one. Mm-hmm. Let's just say that despite definitely being the underdog, the two and zero kid beats the eight and one dude. Mm-hmm. You know, then all of a sudden it's like, hey man, good job, you're a beast. But all the guys that you should be fighting after that, a lot of those guys won't touch you afterwards because yeah. you just beat the number one dude in three states. And uh, you know, so that's kind of something that you have to look at, and, and that's part of you know what we try to do is just say, hey. From a skills perspective, even if you could beat this dude right now, now's not the right time. Let's get another mm-hmm. couple of fights to where then it's like from a, a momentum perspective, yeah. things aren't you know adversely affected. Um, I've seen plenty of guys, they only have a couple of fights, but they beat nothing but studs right out the gate. Mm-hmm. And then they still need another four or five plus fights. Mm-hmm. And getting them is extremely hard. And then the fights you do get are against nothing but top tier opposition. And that's a very mm-hmm. tough road. Um, you know, fighting nothing but, you know, high record studs and big show bets and stuff. Yeah. Um, that's, that's kind of, we, we try to look at the matchup, not just for what it is now, but for what it'll be in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, the flip side to that is, you know, some guys, you know, if they're coming off an injury or a long layoff or other things, maybe they don't want to go in and jump right back in against a seven to no guy. Yeah. I understand that. But at some point, if you're going to make a move to get into a bigger organization, you have to prove that you can be good talent. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's various dudes out there in different parts of the country that, you know, they, they on paper, they look like a beast until you start looking at the people that they've beat. And then you start to see that like that 10 and 0 doesn't really look as impressive because you're beating dudes who are like one and 26, yeah. you know, and, and, and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So just trying to, you know, get guys into the right fights that will progress them at whatever stage they're in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and sometimes that might mean that maybe taking an opportunity on a smaller show versus a more high profile regional event or, you know, like the LFA or mm-hmm. Titan, you know, but if the matchup just really isn't looking good compared to another fight that may be, um, you know, better for a guy, um, you know, sometimes that's something you have to look at, you know, um, yeah. if you're coming yeah. off a two year layoff due to injury maybe jumping back in there against the undefeated 10 and 0 monster who was a multiple time D one, all American wrestler. Mm-hmm. Maybe that isn't the best idea. And sometimes mm-hmm. you just have to let guys know that, you know? So what do you, what do you do? Like I said, be, I'm now just focusing on you as a manager. Mm-hmm. What do you do when somebody is a killer, like, 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 like an Andrew Whitney and nobody mm-hmm. wants to fight him. Then you get the fight between like Andrew Whitney and, you know, John Sweeney where all the fans <laughs> wanted this fight. Yeah, it happened. So the buzz was there. Yeah, the, potential, the sell tickets were there. It's just that we couldn't get that fight to make. And now he seems like he can't get any fights. What do you do with somebody the caliber of an Andrew Whitten? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, yeah. The you know the the regional circuit. It's like a pyramid. You know what I mean? It's like you're working your way up, and there's a ton of lower level guys who are fighting. You know, pro debuts, guys with only a couple fights. And, yeah. And as you work your way up, some guys fall off. Some guys aren't really in pocket training or fighting anymore. And as you go up, it's like, you know, the the higher you get, it, it's kind of a double-edged thing because it's like you're closer to a big show, mm-hmm. you know. And, and we've got a, a ton of guys, you know, fighting in the UFC. We've got a ton of guys fighting in Bellator, yep. you know, the PFL. You know, our relationships with all those larger promotions are very strong. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's like right now there's a ton of people on the UFC's roster. You know, they've been cutting a lot of people recently just because of that. But yeah. um, the higher you get correspondingly, the less options there are really out there. So sometimes it can be tough when you're at the top of the pyramid regionally, but it's like, you're starting to look around and and be like, damn, win or lose. I've already fought every applicable dude Mm -hmm. in this state and in this state and in Mm -hmm. this state. So, I mean, you know, and you know, some four and one dude isn't really going to fight Andrew Whitney. And if you wanted to, I mean, God bless him. And, I'd hope that 864 has, you know, deductible money on hand to cover the ensuing hospital bill. But, um, you know, it's, you know, that that's just kind of the thing is it's like some, you know, you're 
frequency of fights will kind of slow down usually as you get, you know, kind of towards the top of that pyramid. Yeah. Just because, I mean, you start to look, I mean, like say, for example, in Virginia right now, there isn't a single pro bantamweight out there that would even fight a guy like Andrew Whitney. There isn't mm -hmm. anyone even close to his record in a whole state with mm -hmm. a ton of fighters. And the one guy who's maybe even close, his coaches are just notorious for not trying to let that dude fight anyone, much less someone of the caliber of Andrew Whitney. So yeah. I just wouldn't even bother asking him because I, I already know what that answer is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've been running from anyone with any real talent for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and there are plenty of other states that I could just look at and just be like, damn, like, I don't even see anyone on here that is even in his yeah. like overall record level, much less talent and everything else. So, you know, well, it, it's, it's kind of the double edged thing that you end up like that. And it's like, you're not fighting four times a year anymore on the regional scene. You're probably fighting one to three. Mm -hmm. But you like know? I said, but that from, like I said, from my side as a marketer, you know what I'm yeah. saying? My job is to, is to tell the story, promote it, you know, get it to where it makes sense, understand it myself mm -hmm. so the fans sure. can understand it. But now we're in the, to the casual fan, they may not understand why two good guys in the same weight classes from two different states aren't fighting yeah. each other. Like you got, I, I can go Jared Scoggins and, and, um, and, um, uh, God dang it, Milo Blank, out of Georgia. They're gone. His running dog, they will never fight each other. God dang it. Oh, uh, CJ Hamilton? CJ Hamilton. God dang it. Sorry, CJ. Oh, okay. I didn't know who you are, man. My mind went blank. <laughs> yeah, but, CJ, but they ain't they going to never, ever fight. But like I said, to the average fan, that's the natural fight to make. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So now yeah. they have their own career paths. So by not fighting each other, then you're hoping on you getting great fights. Then if you never get a great fight again, you just missed out on that great opportunity that, that everybody would have wanted to pay for to see. What do you yeah. do? Um, it, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Um, as far as that stuff goes, sorry, I'm gonna have to get up and grab a charger here. I didn't realize how low I was, but uh, no, we're, gonna, we're gonna wrap up in a minute. We're, we're, I, I just keep keep okay. coming at me, yeah. So. yeah, so uh, as far as that stuff goes, um, you know, I would say that uh, you know, friends or buddies that you train with a lot that aren't at your primary gym and cross mm -hmm. training and all that stuff. That's cool and everything, but I, I know in some regions, the cross training and the gym affiliations through jujitsu affiliations, like, oh, hey, we're all from so-and-so jujitsu affiliation, so we yeah. don't fight any guys from this other thing. Mm -hmm. That's cool. You know, friends are great, but when you are friends or training partners with so many dudes that are out there at your weight class in your region, you just kind of have to understand that at the same time, at some point that's going to deprive you of, of certain opponent options mm -hmm. and that cuts down on your opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if, if you train at seven different gyms and that many other guys are exposed to you and if you're great, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of these other guys that you would maybe need to fight, they're not going to fight you because maybe they've trained with you before and you tuned them up already a couple yeah. times. And so yeah. they're just like, man, I know I don't want that. Mm -hmm. So it's like, don't, I'm not a fan of giving people tape. On our guys, I don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I've, I've even had opponents, coaches, or managers even hit me up and just be like, hey, we're thinking about taking the fight. You know, can you send us some videos of your last fight? And, you know, my uh, response is usually a little bit more polite iteration of, you know, fuck off, high school football is over. I'm not going to give you tape, <laughs> you know. Um, and, uh, you know, but, you know, it, when you're going to all these different gyms and you train with like, you know, six, eight, ten different guys in your weight class in your overall region throughout a couple of states, that's great. You get a lot of training looks. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. But you're also giving for, you know, fit for better or for worse, you're giving other fighters, um, you know, information on you and you could potentially deprive yourself yeah. of more opportunities in the future. Okay. Um, so with the, with the cross training and the, Oh, like I'm not going to fight him because he's my friend. You know, I wouldn't recommend unless they're in your home gym, if they're mm -hmm. in your gym, then fighting them's not even a question, right? Like that's yeah. your regular training partner, your mm -hmm. whatever. But outside of your main team, I wouldn't recommend having more than one or two friends. Yeah. If they're in your weight class at the pro level okay. regionally, you know, right, so, so we go wrap this up. So, so, sure. so the, the, the topic of the day was 
should a fighter have a manager? So let's leave with this. Give them, give them a, a good one or two lines as, yeah. as your opinion about a fighter having a manager. What do you think is the bottom line it should be? Uh, you know, I would say that whether it's a manager or a trainer that takes care of, you know, some of the things in that capacity, if they're experienced or whatever, it doesn't have to be someone from a big company. Uh, I, I know plenty of managers that maybe only have a couple of clients, mm -hmm. but, you know, they do a good job for their people and they understand the business and they understand kind of the pay scale and what demands or, you know, kind of things that they ask for contractually make sense. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's what you want. You just want someone who's in your corner. That if, you know, negotiations and, and, and contractual stuff really isn't your forte, they can kind of help you out there, take some things off your plate and negotiate on your behalf to, you know, get you good situations and good contracts. Um, you know, uh, kind of some, you know, it, not everyone has to be a lawyer or, you know, have a PhD or, you know, be an economist or all, all these other crazy things. You know, I know plenty of managers that don't have that background, but, um, you know, just find someone who's competent, who's reasonable. Um, you know, sane, mm -hmm. literate, um, and, you know, someone who can just understand what it is they're looking at and also not act like a total crazy person mm -hmm. and make it so promotions don't want to give you opportunities because they would rather claw their eyes out than deal with your manager. <laughs> um, so, you know, that, that's kind of what I would say, mm -hmm. you know, it, just find someone who's in your corner, you know, who, who supports you, you know, who will look out for you and, you know, irrespective of whatever financial arrangement or percentage you give to that manager actually gives a shit and wants mm -hmm. the best for you yeah. and progressing your career. I got you. All right, every fight fans, you heard it. Dave Arvello from Sucker Punch Entertainment tells you exactly how he sees it. And like I said, me and him, we've been friends for a minute, so we, we can do this dance all day. So I'll probably show yeah. this in part two because now, see, that was the clean PC educational version. Probably the next time we talk, we're going to go ahead and let it cut loose and really have some real fun about how we really <laughs> feel. But that's, yeah. that's what it is. We wanted to get us out there and let people know that there's many levels to this game as a fighter dealing with promotions and dealing with managers. I don't recommend you should do anything. I mean, if you're an amateur, it is what it is. But if you're a pro, I think you should always have a manager, you know, somebody that's going to be working on your behalf to make sure everything goes right. So you're not on Facebook you know, singing for yourself or, or you, you're not hearing about a jacked up contract that should never happen. You know what I'm saying? Because it is what it is. But once again, this is Coach D, Fight Camp Promotion, doing what I'm doing, talking for Dave Arvello from Sucker Punch Entertainment. If you're here for me again, peace out.